Workshop one, track two. We're in the Maryland Ballroom B, and we are here to talk about really interesting research uh, by Sandy Darity and Derek Hamilton, um, and both professors um, doing really great, innovative research. Uh, the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color, and specifically looking at Baltimore City today. My name is Elizabeth Talbert. I am a 21CC staff member, PhD student at Hopkins. Um, this is going to be a great session. The way it's going to work is um, Professor Hamilton's going to talk for about 30 minutes. We're going to try to keep him to between 30 and two hours, right? No, no, about 30 minutes. Um, we're going to talk for about 30 minutes. Um, then we have two respondents. We have Lori Feinberg from the um, city of Baltimore and Tommy Hires from the Annie E. Casey Foundation. Um, and we'll do a little uh, response to the presentation. And then we're going to open it up to your questions and your conversation. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to Derek Hamilton. So I want to see if my, unless we're recording, will I be able to use the without mic? Sometimes I'll, we are recording. All right. OK. <laughs> All right. Uh, um, so as was mentioned, this is a project where we're collecting asset and debt information targeted at communities of color, disaggregated at a local, at a, at a local level, looking at in particular metropolitan areas, or in the case of Baltimore, the city area. We're looking specifically in the city of Baltimore. Um, I'm going to present the context of wealth overall, wealth disparity, and then show you some very preliminary results for which I'm not going to ask you not to cite or distribute because they really are preliminary in that we, we uh, calculated a lot of results over the weekend. We've, so so don't, I'm not ready for it to be cited yet. We're not ready. Uh, William Darity, Sandy, as he's more affectionate known, he's going to present this afternoon. And he's also the, him and I are the primary investigators on the project. And he's going to give you an overview of the whole project, looking at the other five metropolitan areas as well. So let me get into it. This is, again, the National Asset Scorecard for Communities of Color. And it came about because the research community was dissatisfied with the federal data infrastructure on asset and debt. You know, the census is really good about giving us information at a local level for groups very specific in their national origin, but it doesn't tell us about wealth. And then the survey of consumer finance, the PSID, those national data sets can give us information about wealth, but they're not local, nor can you disaggregate groups. Generally, you get black, white, sometimes Latinos, and hardly ever Asians. But we know that the asset position of a Cuban in Miami might not be the same of a Mexican in LA. So we, we sought to do this project. All right. Um, so here's the context that we live. And I'm going to breeze through the beginning of the, of the presentation so that we can get an adequate discussion, as well as I can get into some of the data from, from Baltimore. But this is the context in which we live. We live in a context of income disparity, wealth disparity, underemployment, um, unemployment, income work hour and expense volatility where workers don't know how long and how often they're going to be working and then with with it's particularly fluctuations in climate our utility bills fluctuate from month to month we have a, a great risk shift that was described by jacob hacker where we used to have social insurance from the corporate sector and the government sector to now households and private and individuals are expected to carry the burden of, of social insurance in the way they have it in the past. So with these budgetary shortfalls and vulnerabilities, and uh, we have a scenario where the most vulnerable amongst us, particularly those without assets, are subject to predatory finance. Um, exposure to economic downturns, international transfers of both affluence and poverty. Um, if we have wealth stripping from municipal fees, fines, debt. We have uh, the impact of mass incarceration. And then we have the cumulative effect on one's mental health as well as physical health that might manifest in social psych from social psychological stress through stigma. The rhetoric of keep working, work hard might lead to overexertion. We deal with micro and macro aggressions at work and in society in general, stereotype threat, and implicit bias. This is the context for which we're doing this, this, this analysis. All right, the conventional ways of thinking about the middle class is to def define an intern the income, education, or occupation. We tend to look at some middle, middle grouping of income. Usually, the, we get rid of the top 20 and the bottom 
or we use education, those who graduated from college, or occupation, those that are in a managerial professional job as an indicator of, of one's class position. That underestimates the scope of financial insecurity. Wealth becomes one of the primary indicators of one's well-being. But another way of thinking about wealth that we often don't is wealth's ability to have an input on your ability to achieve outcomes. We think of wealth as an outcome in and of itself, but if you have wealth, you can do things. All right. Um, so uh, we did this study in Boston where we looked at middle class families defined by the traditional ways in which we define middle class and asked them about their wealth. And again, I'm going to breeze through this. This is qualitative. Um, it's important because we intend to do it in Baltimore as well. Uh, but this, if you're familiar with the Boston context, you know these row houses. And uh, usually you have multiple generations living, sometimes you have multiple generations living in these houses and they're able to pool resources as well as care work across, across these living arrangements. So we, we looked at black respondents who were either born in the U.S. or migrated to the U.S. And uh, here's an example of a woman, Natalie, who's a 50-year-old Caribbean black elementary school principal who's middle class by every traditional way of defining middle class, occupation, education, and income. Here's what she says. Working class means you don't have substantial savings. Everything is contingent on going to work. She goes on to say, we're not well enough that if something were to happen to me, we could survive for no more than six months tops. It's all dependent on me waking up and going to work and getting paid every other week. There's no investments. There's no business. It's just me getting up every day. People look, might look at my salary and think I'm doing very well, but it's all contingent on me going to work. So she's defining her situation based on her job. That's the way many of our respondents define their, their economic situation. It was all based on their work. So the importance of work, work wealth, I'm going to breeze through this slide quickly to, get, to get, get on to some of the empirical results. But what is wealth? Wealth is the total stock of all your savings minus all your debts. Unlike income, it's not a flow. It is a stock. It is an, it is an asset. Um, wealth indicates, as I mentioned, an, a, one's ability to acquire uh, things so that they can promote economic opportunity, their economic security, and overall well-being. For instance, if I'm a university professor, but if I thought I was a gourmet chef and wanted to leave my job and open a restaurant, I could not finance that out of income. My dream of being a chef would not be realized unless I had wealth, as an example. Um, that was meant to be a joke. If you ever tasted my cooking, you would be laughing right now. <laughs> All right. Um, wealth provides for what the uh, Nobel laureate Amartya Sen might describe as a human capabilities approach to development. It enables people to be self-defining and self-determining and in, in, in determining their well-being. The primary source is not behavioral, but rather structural. Getting access to some capital finance at a key juncture in one's life allows them to purchase an asset that will passively appreciate over their lifetime. Um, and uh, we have a historical precedent where, um, through public policy, we generated an asset-based middle class. The historian Ira Katz Nelson presents this well in his book entitled When Affirmative Action was white. It's also the economic indicator for which communities of color compared to um, generally the white population are more disparate in, in, uh, in, uh, in attainment of that outcome. So here's an example from the SIP in 2011. This is looking at liquid assets. So these are assets that can be readily converted into cash, pretty much getting rid of home ownership. And we can see that the typical black household, the median black household, had a liquid wealth position of $200, and if we re remove retirement savings, it falls to $25. So again, as I described with that quote, we're talking about a population that is pretty much reliant on their jobs for their subsistence, with, with very little buffer. Um, and Latinos, similar position. Um, it's not as if whites are doing dramatically, they're doing dramatically better than blacks and Latinos, um, but we can still see precarity even amongst whites, um, where the median is $3,000 in, in the bank and about uh, $23,000 if you include retirement savings. All right, so why did we choose Baltimore? As I described, 
We selected various metropolitan areas to do these studies. Baltimore was the, most, the, the last round that we did the study. And we generally chose cities and metropolitan areas that were plural, that had a lot of ethnic groups that we can examine inequality in. Baltimore is not the most plural if we define it in terms of, of uh, communities of color and ancestral origin, especially compared to places like Los Angeles or places like Miami. But what Baltimore was really relevant because of some of the media attention that was going on around criminalization and incarceration. So we wanted to look at another dimension, like what is the role of incarceration as it relates to incarceration and the intersection with race as it relates to asset building. So we chose Baltimore. And we had the help of, of the Annie E. Casey Foundation that, that helped fund it. The primary support came from Ford, but Annie E. Casey gave us a substa substantial amount to help us fulfill this survey. All right. So, um, but here's an article that we published looking at race, wealth, and incarceration. So that, again, this is background. Um, and in this study, we used the National Longitudinal Youth Survey. So it, it traces 14 to 22 year olds at one point in time and looks at them as they age throughout their life course. So we can look at an individual's beginning wealth position and look at how that interacts or relates with incarceration. Namely, we descriptively wanted to look at, does having wealth protect you from future incarceration? And then the secondary component was, if you were incarcerated, how does that relate across race in terms of a future ability to generate wealth? All right. So I'm not going to go through this because I'm not going to bore you with the details of, of the survey. There's an article that's published, so you can uh, read it. Uh, but basically, what we found is that for young adults, those between 20 and 29, beginning in 1985, so this would be my generation, uh, this was the likelihood of ending up incarcerated by race, uh, depending on where we were in the wealth distribution. So probably to not anybody surprised, those with more wealth were less likely to be incarcerated. Um, but across race, regardless of wealth, blacks were a lot more likely to be incarcerated. And here's a this is a graph that was generated by the Washington Post, which looks nicer than the one we published. But the one we published allows you to look at the juxtaposition of the groups across the different wealth deciles. And you can see the blue bar is the black group, the green bar is the white group, and the uh, red bar is the Latino group. So these are for males. And at every level of wealth, well, we see a general pattern that as wealth rises, so does the likelihood of incarceration. Um, but at high levels of wealth for black respondents, they had gr much greater likelihood of being incarcerated than low wealth white individuals. All right, so uh, race matters, clearly. All right. Um, <laughs> We don't want to exclude gender. So we know, that, and from the media, that one of the fastest growing incarceration populations have been black women. So um, now, of course, black men are much more likely to be incarcerated, but we're talking about rate of growth. But if we look at women, by the way, this, the, the scale on this graph is very different than the previous slide. So another, a way that researchers sometimes unintentionally mislead is they change the scale on the vertical axis. So I, I'm not, the, the female rates of incarceration are not comparable to the male rates, but changing the scale on the graph, we can see also that white women, regardless of wealth, are generally less likely to be incarcerated than black women at, at every level of wealth. Okay. All right, uh, last background, and then I'm gonna get into the Baltimore stuff. Uh, does education, does working, and does income solve the racial wealth gap? No, it does not. Um, black individuals that have, were the head of household graduated from college have a lower net wealth position by about two thirds in comparison to white individuals that reside in families or white families where the head dropped out of high school. And neither does employment. White unemployed individuals where the head is unemployed, their family wealth position is nearly double that of black families where the head is working full time. And a black head of household that with a black head of household that's unemployed has virtually no wealth to deal with their, their economic calamity. All right. Income doesn't either. We can look at the middle de de middle income distribution. Black middle class individuals have less wealth if we define middle class in terms of income than white individuals with low wealth. All right. So NAS, the purpose of NAS was to provide 
an implicit control of asset and debt pricing and products. We know that the housing market in Baltimore is not the same as New York City. So if we want to compare inequality, we probably want to look at a local context so that we have an implicit control of the products and prices that are available to the individuals in that local area. Um, uh, we also want to look at wealth that's not hidden by that catch-all phrase of non-white. So we looked at Tulsa, for example, to get at American Indian wealth. And then Sandy's going to present a lot about this later. And then we also measured attributes around asset and debt that traditional surveys don't often cover. Like, have you used a payday loan institution? Have you had to go, go to a pawn shop? Have you been late in paying any bills? Right, so we captured these attributes in the survey as well. Now, in the end, uh, if Sandy and I are put out of business, that's great. We hope this serves as a template so that the federal government can one day take upon this type of analysis to provide the research community as well as the nonprofit community and the activist community the data they need to carry forth their work. All right. Limitations. It's expensive to do these, so we don't have lots of observations. Concerns around external validity. So again, I said we looked at Tulsa to look at Native Americans. Not all Native Americans live in Tulsa. In fact, many live in rural areas. So the experiences of a Cherokee in, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, might not be representative of a Cherokee living somewhere else. Um, and then also, as people point out, we're looking at individual household assets and debt. So to the extent that a park provides a public asset or a great school provides a public asset, we're not capturing that in our analysis. Okay. All right, uh, how am I doing on time? I'm good. OK, so uh, in terms of selection of cities, well, as I pointed out, we, we, we looked at metropolitan areas. And the goal was to get some geographical and demographic diversity. And again, Sandy's going to talk about this later. We wanted cities that were plural. And then we also wanted to look for certain other features. For example, like I said, Tulsa, we really wanted Native Americans in our survey. So we, we wanted a Midwest city that has a good amount of black, Latinos, whites, as well as natives. Um, but you know, one thing that we're missing, we don't have a city with a lot of, a, a lot of population that is uh, Arab in origin. So uh, I shouldn't list Muslim, that's a religion. But it's Arab in origin. So it would be good if we can do this in, say, Detroit metropolitan area, where there is a high concentration of people from the Middle East as well. All right. Uh, these are the cities we examined. And then the, late, the last edition, this slide is old, would be Baltimore. OK. All right, so I'm going to take a breath and get into Baltimore. All right, so details. The survey was collected between October and November of 2016. Now, due to having to piece together various sources of funding, we had to take a break at the end of November, November and resume in January, and that was just simply due to funding cycles. The average survey took about 45 minutes to do. It ranged between 17 and 75 minutes, and we offered an exchange of $25 to incentivize participation, as well as to reward people for enduring our survey. And it, this survey was conducted in English. The other surveys included other language translations. All right, uh, in a context for why we chose Baltimore in particular, again, we wanted to target black whites and exposure to incarceration. So one of the criteria for being selected for one portion of our survey was if they or a family member had ever been incarcerated. And then later, I added the criteria incarcerated or spent over 30 days in a local jail. Okay. And then here's an example of the population. We can see that Baltimore is a city that has a high level of exposure to incarceration, and that uh, black individuals, about 9% of black families in Baltimore, uh, or black, these are individuals, not families, have been incarcerated. Okay. All right, uh, we had to, like I said, these surveys are expensive to run and hard to, to get information. So going back, only 1.4% of the Baltimore, well, that's still high, 1.4% of the Baltimore white population has been incarcerated. So if we're collecting this information through surveys, uh, we, we ran into financial problems in doing random surveys for that entire group. So we had to do some targeting survey as well. 
So Research RTI is our partner, and they sent out a survey at a, a Facebook post to recruit some sample, some observations for our sample. And this is what the, the, the advertisement in Facebook looked like. I'm afraid to say advertisement in Facebook these days. <laughs> All right. All right, so uh, again, we did the survey by random digit dialing on cell phones. And then this is just the, and we did that for most of the survey, except a portion of our incarcerated survey was recruited via Facebook. And these, this is the breakdown of that incarcerated group that was recruited through Facebook in comparison to random digit dialing coding. And what we find is that uh, the Facebook survey for blacks had, slight, had higher incomes and for whites, had lo the, the non-Facebook recruited sample had lower incomes. So why am I presenting this? This tells us something about representativeness. I have, we have not weighted the data yet, but for this portion of the survey, um, one of the benefits of using medians is that to the extent that we don't have a, a, repre a completely representative sample, at least we're using some measure of central tendency. Um, but nonetheless, we have most of our observations, 50 from random digit dialing for blacks, 17 for whites, versus 23 and 11 from, from non-random surveying. I, I, uh, another word would be convenient surveying. Okay. All right. Um, I'm going to actually skip this. This is the targets that we originally set out, and this is what we attained. Um, but here's what, now we're getting into some of these results. And again, I caution you that this is preliminary. I, we have a good amount of confidence that they're at least going to be substantively correct. Um, but don't cite the actual numbers because there very well may be slight coding errors that, that we need to adjust. Um, but for our whole sample, we had, this is our ethnic background. There are about 151 black-only observations, uh, four observations that were black and something else but non-white, seven black and white observations, 89 white only, and about three white and something else and non-black. So I collapsed, we collapsed these into other categories that I'm going to present in detail later, and that is if you identified as black and no previous incarceration, but these are black individuals that could be anything else other than white, um, and this is black with previous incarceration from you or your family member, and again, this can be black and anything else except white, and these are white, non-previous, and white previous incarceration with no identification as black. And then you can see the, the number of observations that we have to analyze. And then for another group, I'm just looking at a catch-all of all the families in our sample that identified as being previous incarcerated or having a family member that was previously incarcerated. So let's look at what we found. All right, so financial account usage. We know that in this age of, of, uh, of finance that having access to, to a bank or a formal financial institution is vital to make our everyday needs. And we can see that there's variation in group in terms of who actually had a bank account. That if you were white with, with no, the white no, no incarcerated sample, about 92% of them had a banking account. And the lowest likelihood was if you were black and, in, and your family had some exposure to incarceration, nearly half of you didn't have a bank account. Okay. No one in the family. These are family level measures. We can look at stock ownership, and again, not to anybody's surprise, the white no incarcerated group, 35% had stocks versus all the other groups. In terms of retirement, about 83% of them reported some retirement account or some pension versus uh, for blacks that had no previous incarceration, nearly half that rate of 40%. And for the white with incarceration, 50%, and this is, so if you don't have access to formal banking, you tend to have to resort to check cashing institutions that have much higher fees for banking. And you can see that there's great disparity in terms of who used the check cashing institution in the last year. That's what the question asks. 19% of black families that had exposure to incarceration used the check cashing institute, and 13% who did not in comparison to 3% of whites who did not have exposure and 8% who did. So what are we seeing? Basically, that incarceration is associated with less access to formal banking, and that race is also associated with less access to formal banking, and that 
in some cases, the white, the white previously incarcerated group had greater access to banking than the black group that indicated no incarceration. And I'm just going to pause for a second and say there's a theme. We have this rhetoric about what determines social economic outcomes, and we talk about good behavior, education, working, not being incarcerated. But these so-called themes of good behavior, if we look across race and look at the white group that has the, the worst inputs in terms of education, incarceration, they tend to manifest better on many of the socioeconomic outcomes than blacks that have the best attributes in terms of inputs. All right, home ownership, 34% of blacks indicated that they own their home versus about 70% of whites. And again, incarceration mattered. For the incarceration group, 19%. Vehicle ownership, um, well, we know this is not generally a wealth generating asset, but as was discussed earlier, vehicles allow you mobility to get, for instance, one job to another job or even a job period. And we can see that there's great variation in terms of vehicle ownership also. 27% of families where a member was previously incarcerated had a, had a, had a vehicle. And this is access to owning a business and then other real estate as well. So again, we see a pattern of disparity across race and, and experience with incarceration. And then this, is a, this is, slide is looking at, well, who gets access to a transfer in their life? And uh, who gets access to a transfer in their life? So the first is, do you, did you receive a substantial in vivo transfer? So somebody gave you a gift and it had to be over $10,000. The second is inheritance, and this is whether you got inheritance or a gift. And where's my typo? Ah, there you go. <laughs> and then we have uh, parents' inheritance. Sandy created the slides if it's a typo. <laughs> I'm joking. All right, so uh, the last one is looking at this multi-generational likely access to transfer. So this is if one of your parents received a transfer or not. And we see this pattern that, again, uh, in terms of in vivo transfers, there's variation, but not as much. And you know, some of this could be associated with, you know, uh, if black individuals that are middle class, they're more likely to have a relative that's in poverty than a white individual that's similarly middle class. So some of that could be middle class individuals making transfers to less well-off relatives to make basic needs. Um, but inheritance is probably not the case as much for, for that type of transfer. But if we look combined, again, if you're white and not incarcerated, 42% received a transfer, white incarcerated, 31%, and that, that's more, more lar larger than 25 and 19%. Okay. All right. This is looking at debt. So now we're looking at student loan, legal bills, fines and fees, and medical bills. And again, we get a similar pattern. Student loan, well, you know, to get this type of debt, you have to be enrolled in school. So we have variation in likelihood of student loan debt, but what's not presented in the slide is the value of that debt. And we will do that later, but what do we know from the literature? Black individuals are more likely, black individuals with student loan debt are have higher levels of debt than their white counterparts and are also less likely to graduate than their white counterparts. So they're more likely to be uh, saddled with student loan debt and without a degree. And then with the rise of predatory finance, you can see the work of Tressie McMillan Cotton. Um, we can see that for-profit institutions are targeting certain communities, including blacks, with, with products that might not be um, as useful in the marketplace and, and, and require high levels of debt. Legal bills, so that, again, this is relevant for our incarceration sample. We can see 15% of black previous incarcerated had legal bills. Fines and fees, so this is municipal fees and fines. Do you have any of these? Again, we see variation in this type of debt, which might lend itself to some in indications about are we preying on certain types of populations with certain types of debt to inhibit their ability to accumulate wealth. And then finally, medical debt, all right? Payday loans, so this is, again, if you don't have formal banking and you have low resources, your alternative, in many cases as a last resort, becomes use of things like a payday loan, 
a pawn shop um, or some other non-conventional finance to make your everyday needs, particularly in this era of volatility in terms of your, your work and your expenses. Um, and probably to not people's surprise, given the pattern that I've been presenting, there's variation in likelihood of using a payday loan in the fat last five years, likelihood of using a pawn shop in the last five years, and then uh, that might manifest itself in terms of check cashing use as well. Yeah. All right. Liquid assets. So now we're getting into some values. So these are median values of liquid assets, which is I'm defining this as assets that can be readily converted into cash, excluding retirement savings. Financial assets, we add retirement savings. Tangible assets become basically car and homes, assets that are consumable, non-financial assets. And this is assets in general. Um, again, not to anybody's surprise, the black, well, at this point, not to people's surprise, the black population is largely uh, close to zero uh, in terms of the median person in terms of having assets, whether they're incarcerated or not. Um, what surprised us, and again, this is preliminary, is that even for whites in Baltimore City, the other cities, the other surveys look at the metropolitan area, but looking only in Baltimore City, we're finding that the tangible value of white assets is only 28,500. It was higher, much higher in other cities. Um, but again, that, that is substantially, although low, higher than black, the black group. Okay? The net asset position, the, not the, the asset position of whites in general was about 137,000. All right? Um, this is income. So if you live in Baltimore, you probably know there's large income disparity, and it is. We find that the median black non-incarcerated family income, 27, $12,000 for black families that had a, a, some relative that had been previously incarcerated in comparison to 77,000 and 20,000 for whites with some previous incarceration. Um, so these are large disparities. They're non-trivial. But look at wealth. If we look at wealth, the median wealth position of black families is virtually zero and negative if you've had exposure to incarceration. For whites, it's 125,000. And then white individuals that had exposure to incarceration, they face, their families face precarity as well. They have a net wealth position of about $21,100, okay? Two, sorry, $2,100, I added an extra zero. $2,100, okay. All right, so the, you know, the, the punchline is that um, the wealth position of many families in Baltimore is uh, problematic but incarceration and race certainly play a, a major role in determining one's wealth position. So summary, variations across account uses based on race and exposure to incarceration. We saw that white and non-incarcerated families were more likely to have access to formal banking and less likely to use predatory finance or alternative finance like check cashing or payday loans. We saw variations in receipt of transfers and inheritance Similar story that white non-incarcerated families were more likely to receive an inheritance or an in vivo transfer in comparison to um, black and incarcerated families. Variation in exposure to debt, and it, it is particularly important to think about fines and fees as a new mechanisms of, of localities balancing their budgets and who has to bear that burden, what groups are, are vulnerable to that. Um, Income inequality is extreme in Baltimore, but pales in comparison to wealth inequality. And then the, the point of this study is looking at the intersection of race and incarceration. And that intersection, at least preliminary, is nuanced. Um, black families exposed to incarceration face the greatest financial vulnerability. But the nuance is that the intra-racial difference based on exposure to incarceration is more severe for whites, right? So this. I'm going to say a little, a little anecdote before I move on and, and pass the mic over. There's a study by Diva Pager that looks at the intersection of race and incarceration with regards to likelihood of getting a job callback. And one of the main points is that white families, white individuals that signal prior incarceration are more likely to get a callback than black individuals 
who did not signal prior incarceration. But she also looks at the relative difference in if you're white and you signal prior incarceration versus white and you don't, and black if you signal prior incarceration and black if you don't. And what she finds is that the gradient for, for the, the percentage difference for blacks, so 14% of blacks who did not signal prior, 14% of blacks who did not signal prior incarceration got a call back, 5% who did signal prior incarceration got a call back. That's a difference of about three to one. For whites, it was 34% who didn't signal prior incarceration versus I think it was uh, about 17% who did signal prior incarceration. That's a difference of about two to one. So she concludes that the impact of incarceration is more severe on blacks than it is for whites based on that percentage difference. I have a different interpretation. The absolute value of the difference is much larger for whites than it is blacks. The absolute value of the difference for blacks is about 14 versus 5%, that's nine percentage points. For whites, 17 versus 34%, that's about what, 17 percentage points. So what does that mean? Incarceration was more severe for the white population than it was the black population, which is indicative of the fact that regardless of incarceration, blacks are pretty not well off in, in that employment study, and it seems to be the case in this, in this study as well, that incarceration is definitely making you worse off, but relative to whites, the, the penalty for incarceration is less severe which is really indicative of a structure in society that penalizes based on race. Hello. We're now going to have our discussants come up and, and say a few comments, and then we can go on and um, you know have questions and conversation with the audience. Hi, I'm really not sure where to start because that was a lot of um, information. Um, so, hi, I'm Tommy Hire from the uh, Annie E. Casey Foundation, and. Um, I spent a, a good chunk of my career working with um, individuals who were making that inevitable transition from prison back to their careers and families. And so it's somewhat disheartening to see that, um, although I've been away from that work for a while, that a lot of it has not changed, um, that we're still um, facing some of the same challenges um, that we were talking about 10, 15 years ago um, with respect to reentry. And so the link between incarceration and opportunity or lack thereof is still um, very real. Um, the Casey Foundation was very proud to support this work and we're also excited about another report that's gonna be coming out um, in about a month um, through the Job Opportunities Task Force that's looking at the criminalization of poverty. Um, and how by simply being poor, some of the pitfalls that we experience can have us um, caught up in the criminal justice system, creating yet another vicious cycle, which will play itself out in some of the uh, statistics that Derek uh, just shared with us. Um, last year, in 2016, the Maryland Department of Public Safety and Correctional Services had about 6,900 new intakes into its prison system. Roughly 3,000 of them were individuals from Baltimore City. And we're still seeing a disproportionate percentage of individuals come from and return to the same communities in Baltimore City. And so we're still grappling with that same fundamental question, and what condition do we want individuals to return to their communities and families? And so as we think about creating pathways to opportunities, um, it's almost always about jobs and employment. And we've spent a tremendous amount of time thinking about ways to engage employers and to figure out how to create pipelines for individuals with criminal uh, records to not simply get a job, but to have an opportunity where they can earn a living wage. And while there's been a tremendous amount of progress that's been made um, in those areas, it, it hasn't been enough. And so now the conversation is becoming a lot broader and there's 
been more focused on entrepreneurship opportunities and thinking about ways to provide access to capital so that a, wide, um, a wider category of individuals can not only start businesses, but to keep businesses open and alive and well. And so as we think about um, addressing the wealth gap, which in Baltimore City, African American families have an annual income rather of roughly $33,000 compared to $68,000 for their white counterparts. As we think about ways to shrink that gap, um, jobs but also business ownership has um, emerged as a way to do that. And so at Casey, we're starting um, to dabble in a new body of work where we're focused on uh, black owned businesses in Baltimore City. Um, in conducting a landscape analysis, we found that roughly 47% of small businesses in Baltimore City are black owned. Roughly 10% of those businesses have employees. And when you do a comparison of businesses with employees, for black businesses with employees, their annual revenues was roughly 690,000 a year compared to their white counterparts with employees of $2.9 million a year. And so one of the points that Derek made um, in his slides was about um, access to capital and how do we how do we use our networks to create um, ways for um, entrepreneurs to get the capital that they need in order to support their businesses and their work um, many um, banks are do not have products available that um, are accessible by small businesses and so it um, it creates opportunities for them to go to CDFIs to get money, or if that doesn't work out, some of the more predatory um, lending strategies that Derek also highlighted um, in his report, whether it's credit card debt, payday loans, or some other um, unsavory financing uh, matter. But one of the challenges for our CDFIs here in Baltimore City is that um, they have roughly $1.5 million in operating capital available to them, which is not quite enough to lend compared to, say, in Detroit, on average having $8 million on hand to lend. So there's an issue where not only do these institutions that tend to be more friendly to small businesses don't have enough capital on hand, um, they also don't have the capacity themselves to work as closely with small business leaders who are by and large people of color to help them to navigate through that process. The other is um, for organizations that um, attempt to provide technical assistance and capacity building support for small businesses to help prepare them to take advantage of funding opportunities, they are under-resourced as well. And so there's a lack of um, infrastructure and investment in these organizations to help create the pipeline for minority-led businesses to create economic opportunities in communities. And so what we're grappling with is how can we, one, invest in CDFI so that they have the capacity to work with businesses and get loan products to them to grow their businesses and secondly how can we help create a technical assistance pool for organizations who are helping to provide technical assistance and capacity building for small businesses we think that by investing in small businesses especially businesses that are led by people of color that we can help promote economic growth and opportunity in Baltimore communities the same communities that are disproportionately impacted by issues such as incarceration thank you um, this is great um, it's great to see the research focusing on Baltimore um, Sad to say, I'm not surprised by anything you you presented. I, I, you know, that's not good news, and I think most people from Baltimore would agree. Um, I think there's a couple challenges. Um, one of the things that spoke to me was the issue of the the property ownership, and that's really how wealth has been historically built in this country. And you know, what are we doing in that area and home ownership? And I think Baltimore's numbers can be particularly sort of skewed in those areas um, because our rentals have gone up, our home ownership prices are relative, they've gone up but are relatively reasonable, but we still don't have the tools to get people into home ownership in a reasonable way. So whether it's that you know 20% deposit so they don't have the 
uh, monthly mortgage insurance and some of those products, um, many of our um, uh, lower income people can't even fathom the idea of getting into home ownership, yet their monthly rent is the same as you would pay for a mortgage. You know, so there's a real, I think that's a real issue in Baltimore. And I guess, um, you know, what I'm interested in, that's why I asked the question, and maybe Sandy will, will get into this a little bit here, is, okay, so now what do we do? What does this information tell us as policymakers? What should we be doing? And, and personally, I'd like to know, I mean, I, I read some of the literature about things like baby bonds or, you know, some of these other tools to try to equalize in the wealth area. But what I'm interested in from the researchers here is which is the most effective? You know, what, what is your research telling you in people where, you've, where there have been successes in building wealth? Where does the dollar get you? And you know, where, can, where does the dollar get you the most benefit? Now that we, we know the facts, now that we say we have that magic pot of money, what is the, what's gonna get us the most change? And I, it's great that, I mean, Tommy talking about the whole business job and I think the other half of those graphs is also that asset building. Um, and, and generally that is in homes, um, though it can be other things as a, as a place to start. So where does that money get us? And, and then, you know, as a minor point, um, you know, maybe this is just my pet peeve, but the whole financial literacy aspect. We heard Senator Mikulski talking about algebra this morning. And I sat there and said, yeah, algebra is good, but we have like a much more basic level math problem in Baltimore where people don't even understand some of those basic costs. So that affects, it may be a minor factor, but in the scheme of things, we're, we're doing folks a disservice if we're not giving them the tools to, you know, get to the bank or, or those other, you know, uh, columns on your table. So I would love to hear more about where our dollar can be best spent to, um, for those policies. All right, so we're going to have responses, things on the table here, and then we'll open it up to the, the audience. Thank you very much, both of you. All right, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Uh, lots of great questions. Um, so. Uh, the first thing I want to say is that we need to think carefully about the way in which causation operates. So if we're thinking about business ownership, the question is whether or not, oh, okay. So the, the, the first question is whether business ownership builds more wealth or whether it builds new wealth. And do you have to have wealth to get into business ownership in the first place? So that's the tricky issue, is which way does the causation run? I think one of the things that is evident from some of the work we've done using uh, longitudinal data, where we followed people's business experience over time, is that in fact, business ownership does tend to increase or improve people's wealth position. But the sustainability of the business is contingent on their initial wealth position before they start the business or before they engage in business ownership. And so uh, black-owned businesses not only tend to be smaller, but their longevity is, is, is considerably shorter as well. And I think that's attributable to the fact that uh, many of these entrepreneurs don't have an initial pool of wealth to draw upon or to, uh, to make a case for, for uh, credit. With, with lending agencies because uh, typically you have to have wealth to be able to borrow additional funds. So, uh, so, so I, I, I want us to be a bit cautious about business ownership as a route to closing the wealth gap. Similarly, I don't think that uh, jobs are a route towards closing the wealth gap. So if we think about this in the conventional way, uh, what do jobs provide you with? They provide you with income. And people frequently assume that the way in which you build wealth is through savings out of income. But in fact, the primary source of wealth for most people or the foundation for their wealth position are transfers that they receive from previous generations. Uh, 
And that's, those can take two forms that we talked about a moment ago. Uh, one is the more obvious form, which is inheritances. Uh, but there's another form that people tend to de-emphasize and don't even actually recognize frequently, which is what we refer to as in vivo transfers. But essentially, those are gifts. And if you think about it, those gifts can take a number of forms. Suppose uh, a, a, a young person who's recently just finished high school gets a vehicle from their parents. That's an in vivo transfer. Or if your parents or grandparents help fund your college education, so you don't come away with a significant amount of college debt or student loan debt, that's an in vivo transfer. If a young couple that's newly married goes out to purchase a home and their parents and grand or grandparents help them with the down payment on the mortgage. That's an in vivo transfer. And that creates a completely different opportunity locus for building wealth on their own uh, as a consequence of not having certain kinds of burdens that are imposed upon them. And so uh, that's much more important from our perspective than uh, your capacity to engage in deliberate savings out of, out of personal income. And in fact, we know from uh, research that's been done by uh, Ed Wolf and Norman Gittleman that um, uh, if you control for household income, there is no difference between the black and white savings rate. And in fact, in some income categories, the black savings rate is slightly higher. Uh, and one would think this is because the black economic position generally is more precarious. And so people are, are, are more inclined to try to stash some funds away to try to protect themselves. So, uh, so, so that said, uh, let me tur turn to the third option, which is, uh, is home ownership. And, uh, and home ownership, as we now know in the aftermath of the Great Recession, actually can cut in both directions. Uh, you know, one of the consequences of the Great Recession was actually the destruction of equity that people had, had developed in their homes. So we need to be a little bit cautious about that being the absolute solution. And as I'll point out later today, there are ethnic and racial groups in the United States that actually have substantial wealth positions without significant levels of home ownership. So we, we, we may want to think about how, how that's come about. Uh, that said, uh, you know, I think it is important to create greater opportunities for people to get into home ownership in a secure way. Uh, and I think that that would involve providing them with some initial significant amount of wealth to operate with. And I think that's why uh, Derek and I have, have been advocates of something of the equivalent of what's called the baby bonds. It's, the baby bond's not a bond. Okay, the idea behind this, uh, this, this solution to our wealth inequality problem is to provide each newborn infant with an endowment, a publicly funded endowment. So uh, rich folks give their kids trust funds all the time. Why shouldn't every child have a trust fund? And this trust fund would be adapted in terms of amount based upon the wealth position of the child's family. So in our stump speech, we usually say that if Oprah Winfrey had a new child, we'd give them a, a $50 trust fund. But for kids who are born into families at the lowest end of the wealth distribution, we would give them a fifty dollars to $60,000 trust fund. We'd guarantee a 1% rate of interest, real rate of interest, until, uh, until the, the child reaches the age of maturity or adulthood at age 18, in which, at which point they could access this, this, this trust fund. So uh, essentially what we're talking about is a redistribution of wealth, but it's a non-confiscatory redistribution of wealth because we're not taking any wealth away from folks who already have it for the purposes of trying to build wealth for those who don't have much. Uh, it's in that context in which I think financial literacy programs would have some meaning or substance. That is, if we linked financial literacy programs with the provision of some type of trust fund or foundation and wealth for households or for individuals. Uh, otherwise, I, I don't think that financial literacy has much value if you don't have any finance to be literate about. <laughs> the only thing I'll just add is, uh, the one question was, uh, what do we think is the best route to uh, to address this? Like, what like, what are the successes? What, what are the successes? Are successes. What, what, <laughs> I mean, I would say that what, what the scheme of the baby bonds is intended to do is stop trying to manage poverty. 
I think we need to get out of that scheme of trying to manage people. Rather, we need to empower people. So Baby Bonds is intended to give people resources to figure it out themselves. Conservatives have taken that rhetoric and talked about freedom. Well, we're not really given freedom if we don't empower people. So we're trying to come up with schemes and mechanisms to give people the true ability to make choice. Because I don't know whether to purchase a home or invest in a stock market. I'd be lying if I said I did. But um, whatever it is, I'd like to be able to make that choice. Come over here first. Uh, I just had a very brief question. You had a slide that showed um, several different types of, uh, I think, vehicles for wealth, business, home ownership, and the difference between, and I, I could you, do you mind going back to that slide? Because I don't want to mess this up. <laughs> yes. So the difference between black no incarceration and, well, even, black previous incarceration and white previous incarceration is significant. Um, and I believe that that's showing that previously black families with um, some type of black incarceration have more um, opportunity, own more businesses, or is that what that's showing? Right, so a couple things. One is we didn't do any significant tests yet. We were gonna bring that in. But your point is that there's substantive difference between the percentage that's still valid and point but we're not looking at value we're just looking at do you own a business okay and what so my question really is have you been able to kind of induce why that would be, why that would show that a black family with um yes yes i have my own theory I mean, but i'd be interested to hear what you say i mean i, I suspect we might have simpler theories i probably want to hear your theory sometimes you know we think Again, I'm concerned with using entrepreneurship as a panacea. I, I mean, I think it's important to give people choice. We, the, the business wealth gap is a problem from a social justice standpoint, but I think we also put too much faith in entrepreneurship as a solution to all our problems. The vast majority of Americans don't own a business. The highest, the highest ownership group is the white group with 12%. So it's not as if whites have used business as a way to generate, uh, it have, it's not as if business ownership for whites is the pathway towards a middle class in terms of asset ownership, because the middle white doesn't own a business. Um, but I, I think it's an important area to invest and pay attention to. Um, but one of the reasons why we might observe it is because of limited labor market opportunity. And I guess that's the point you're going to make. Yeah. So can I just clarify? Sure, sure. I just want to clarify. It's not that, um, at least from my perspective, I think that. Um, supporting small business is the panacea, but what I do see is that businesses led by people of color are a significant percentage of those in Baltimore City, and there's a tremendous underinvestment. And at the same time, those of us who fund workforce development programs are still looking for placements for individuals, and so why not focus on both ends of the spectrum where we are supporting workforce training placement and retention strategies, but we're also helping to grow business and grow the opportunity in these very same neighborhoods. I don't think it's an either or proposition. I think that we have to think comprehensively about our investments and figure out a way to do both. Agreed. Yeah. I don't know. Should, should we mention the other proposal? Thank you guys so much. And I wanted to take in the conversation from this morning from Mayor Baraka and Mr. McAfee and others to talk about how this reflects a system, right? And how this reflects the way that cities are set up. For example, it's hard to get to a bank if you can't get to a bank. You know, when you drive around different parts of Baltimore, you literally, you have no access to a financial institution other than a check cashing spot or a liquor store. And so the idea, we talk a lot about food deserts, but I, there's a growing conversation around financial deserts, places in the city where people aren't mobile, they don't own a car, um, and there are no banks within a reasonable walking distance. And so the only way to access any money that you do have coming in is through that check cashing. And so part of it is, how are we building and engaging with financial institutions to come into communities? There's an example of a school in Baltimore 
where they worked with the municipal employees credit union to actually open a branch within the school. And so part of the, the school's program of learning um, accounting and business administration, they worked with MeQ to open a branch where teachers could actually go in and take out money and deposit money and different things like that. So not only are we building, because I think to the point of financial literacy doesn't work if you don't have finances, <clears throat> we also can't be talking about home buying with folks who don't have a bank account, who don't have um, even the aspiration of or the, the real picture of owning a home. Um, so there's also that that generational, um, somebody said it this morning, the, the, the bigotry of low expectations um, and that internalized racism. But I think I'd love to hear from you guys uh, any thoughts around the idea of financial deserts and building capacity of communities to manage finance through institutions. Yeah, I mean, it, th th those are all great points. Um, but let me also start by my previous comment. I apologize, Tony, I didn't mean it to be, Tom, I'm sorry, I apologize twice. <laughs> but uh, no, <laughs> I'm gonna go answer the question. Sorry, <laughs> I quit. <laughs> um, wealth to me becomes the real powerful tool to root out a lot of those narratives about personal responsibility and really acknowledge structure. So the previous comment was was very valuable in pointing out a a structural context for why, as Sandy points out, we, we need to question causality. Just because we observe blacks using payday loans and check cashing institutes, is it because they're, they're irrational or, or bad behaved? Or is it because of a structure that forces them to use that? Whereas if you're gonna use, put your money, your meager finances in a bank that's gonna draw $12 every month if you don't have a minimum balance is going to extract your resources, then that choice becomes a, a, a rational choice. The work by Jonathan Mordock and Rachel Schneiderman, uh, they indicate in their financial diaries that when blacks, you, when, when in, individuals in general, mostly blacks, use payday lending, it's usually as a last resort after they've exhausted all types of other mechanisms for getting resources to address their budgetary issues. So I think that's the message we, we all need to take out there is that people seemingly bad behavior without structural context is an erroneous, an erroneous determination or conclusion. So the only thing I'd add too is even in communities where there are financial institutions, there's usually only one. So if you go into a, a white community, you'll have multiple finances. So even if I screw up at one bank and I owe money, I can walk down the street and open an account at another bank and get another chance. I agree with you that check cashing spots are a necessary evil in a lot of communities, but what you lack in a bank is, what you lack in not having a bank account is the ability to earn that interest, right? And so I think I just keep coming back to white communities and black communities and how the difference just in the landscape of banking is similar to the landscape of fresh food. Um, I kind of want to link this discussion to the, the previous, just before it. So uh, this idea that uh, banks aren't in certain communities could be linked possibly to the, the issue that banks have to make loans where they take deposits and they don't want to make loans to certain communities because they're seen as high risk, which is sort of where CDFIs come in, uh, which I think are such an important tool. And you noted um, that the, the availability of capital for CDFIs in Baltimore is uh, much lower than in other areas like Detroit. Uh, are there, in this administration, uh, in Trump's original budget, they wanted to zero out funding for CDFIs. Their argument was that they've worked so well, we don't need them anymore. So let's stop having them. Uh, what can we do uh, as local uh, representatives, as people who care about obviously these issues locally, to advocate for uh, expanding CDFIs in areas that need it like Baltimore? Uh, I don't know if you could provide any insight into that. Um, so so I'm, gonna, I'm gonna pinball a little bit. My, my first reaction is, uh, to the extent that you want, we would like something to happen at the federal level, it's not going to happen <laughs> unless we change the actors at the federal level. So I, I don't think that there's any kind of persuasion or negotiation or anything like that that's going to, uh, to bring the types of policies that we're talking about into effect at the federal level. 
The question becomes whether or not some of these projects could be implemented at the municipal, municipal level. And that's in the face of the process of state level preemption of local government activities. Uh, in the absence of that type of preemption, then municipalities have a tremendous amount of, of discretion or freedom. Uh, one of the issues that arises though, of course, is that municipal budgets for smaller scale communities are actually fairly small in a per capita sense. And uh, if, if, if your state government does preempt you by saying you have to balance your budget at the municipal level, then that reduces opportunities for innovation. But in states where that hasn't occurred, so California might be an obvious example, then I think there's a lot of opportunities to try to do creative things at the local level. Replicate your local version of a CDFI or and, and this is kind of a stronger version of that, introduce the equivalent of a public banking system. So my, my general attitude now is that one of the issues that we really have is a concern about competition. But the traditional ways in which we've addressed the lack of competition is either regulation or privatization. I think that the best way to address a lack of competition is to have a public option so that the federal government or the municipal government or the state government functions as a competitor with the private sector. So if you had a public banking system that had its own independent fee structure, et cetera, had its own set of uh, uh, conditions for borrowing and the like that were more reasonable, it would create a floor on what the private sector would, would, would have to do to offer the same services. It would eliminate payday lending and other predatory forms of lending to the extent that all citizens would have to be acceptable as account takers in these kinds of institutions. And we do have a precedent for public banking. Most people don't think about it, but the Federal Reserve System is a public bank. Okay, it's not, it's not a private bank. It may behave on behalf of the private sector frequently, but it is, it is a public bank. So, uh, so the, I think we need to think about the public option as a way of, of creating a floor on the kinds of expenses or costs that people are confronted with. Hi, uh, I'm Oscar Bello. I'm a reporter with Next City. Um, are there any financial institutions in the room right now, CDFIs or banks? No. Okay, this is, I'm, I'm so curious about this phenomenon. So when, we, when this country decided to create wealth on a widespread scale for millions and millions of, as we know now, white, only white households, it did so with the, in partnership, in collusion with, whatever you want to call it, with a massive decentralized network of banks and credit unions. It created, it spent a, this country spent a decade building federal home loan banks, FHA insurance, and Fannie Mae. It spent a decade building those things, then it spent the next 60, 70 years using those things to build wealth, as we know, only for white households. Um, and it did that with you know, the input of those financial institutions. That would only make loans to white households. So I'm, I'm, I'm always curious about, and, and I'm really curious about this, this baby bond idea. You know, have you had a chance to talk about it with black-owned banks, minority deposit institutions? Um, have you thought about when you create that program, let's say we did it, let's magically have a new federal regime in place and we did it, can we make sure those baby bonds get deposited into institutions that will lend those, that those dollars to black communities in the meantime while they're being accumulated over those first 18 years? I'm curious if, you had, if you've had discussions with financial institutions, minority financial institutions in particular, about some of the policy ideas that you're bubbling up as a result of this research. And I'd also like to hear from our two discussants what you think about you know, that, the, the role of the foundation or the city in something like a baby bond. As a quick answer to your question, is, and that is unfortunately we haven't talked with, with those institutions. We've had conversations with municipalities and other foundations and uh, uh, beyond municipalities, some federal legislators as well. 
Oh. On the baby bond, I think it's very intriguing. I guess I would um, put forward the idea, I think we need to look at it in comparison to other social welfare systems to make the case for it. So if you know X dollars spent gets us this baby bond versus spending it on you know, other social safety nets or other things, because I think if we're selling this concept to people who are gonna be pretty much like, where are we gonna get the money for this? It has to be shown in comparison. I mean, you'd have to be able to make an argument that we're losing money or wasting money somewhere else and it needs to go in this direction. And I'm really intrigued in the idea of how you scale it. So you, you mentioned Oprah's kid versus you know somebody else's, but I assume it has a it would have a full scale of everything in between. So, yeah. so I, I guess I have a question, which is are you talking about an issue in terms of financing it at the municipal level or at the federal level? Because well, at any level. I don't think it matters. So at, at the level. federal level, really there's no constraint. I mean this is this there there's no constraint at the federal level in the sense that, if you think about it, uh, what, immediately after the Great Recession hit, what did we, uh, what did we turn over to the investment banking community? Trillion yeah, $13 trillion. So I, I, you know, at that point, I said, anybody who wants to ask me uh, to claim that any proposal is too expensive, don't say it again, okay? And, uh, and, and of course, uh, a baby bonds proposal if you are covering approximately four million newborn infants each year, and the mean amount of the trust fund, say, is twenty or thirty thousand dollars, then we're talking about something in the vicinity of eighty to one hundred twenty billion dollars a year. We wouldn't have to make the first payout until the first cohort of kids is eighteen years of age. So we could build a fund to support the trust fund. And uh, you know, I, I just, I'm just, I'm, I'm always baffled when people say, "Well, where's the money going to come from? Well, where does the money come from to do anything we do in this country?" Uh, so, uh, but, but I don't think that the baby bonds proposal is is out, outrageously expensive. Now, our other proposal, which I haven't talked about, the federal job guarantee, which is intended to address unemployment and poverty where the federal government would guarantee that every citizen had the right to a job and would provide that job through a public sector employment program, similar to what was done during the Great Depression with the Works Progress Administration and the Civilian Conservation Corps. If we put 15 million people to work under that program at an average expense of about $50,000, then that would cost $750 billion. And it was 15 million people who were unemployed at the trial of the Great Recession. So, uh, so that's, that's a, a good rough number because we're not always in the midst of a Great Recession. And, uh, and $750 billion is approximately the, course, the cost of most of our so-called entitlement programs to address the poverty problem. So you could actually substitute one set of expenses with a new program that would truly eliminate working poverty and would uh, would would ensure that uh, that everyone who wanted a job could have a job, and we could also find out who really doesn't want to work. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I have actually public banking. I don't think has been preempted in North Carolina yet, and that's on my list. <laughs> of things to do, so we should follow up about that later. Um, but I wanted to ask you all, I've been learning a lot over the last year about universal basic income and proposals for that as a poverty reduction and um, redistribution of wealth strategy. There's a pilot project happening in Stockton, California, uh, with a small cohort of folks who will be given some amount of money every month for three years and then tracked over that time um, to study outcomes. And I was wondering um, what you all think about that strategy. So one, uh, so a lot of times we're presented with UBI juxtaposed against federal job guarantee. Um, one is they could serve as complements, um, but the reality is that they both are expensive programs. The UBI program, if we were to do it at the federal level, 
is dramatically more expensive even than a federal job guarantee. Um, but uh, again, I support the idea of giving people resources to manage themselves, and that's in the vein of UBI. But some concerns around UBI is that if it's a flat fee that you give everyone, well, that's almost the definition of inflation. So there, there are concerns that you know all these programs could have inflationary aspects, but literally giving everybody the same value is raising the price level. Um, the other thing is that it could have the unintended consequence of enhancing inequality. If you give someone who's, who's poor an income versus somebody who's wealthy, the wealthy person can invest that and turn around and, and iterate, similar to the concerns we have around wealth, whereas a poor person, through their subsistence, will, will likely have to consume that. So, so, you know, I would support a UBI that was more graduated if we were going to go the UBI route. Um, but, you know, another, another comparison to UBI and, say, baby bonds, we're a little paternalistic in the baby bonds program. UBI, you can use the money whatever, whatever you want. With baby <coughs> bonds, the money is directed towards some asset-enhancing activity, meaning something like either a down payment for a home, seed capital to start a business, or a debt-free college education, but something that's intended to generate assets. Now, why have that provision? Well, um, we know that, again, for certain households, I'll take myself as an example, if you had infused me with cash at 25 years old, I have a whole lot of relatives that need some, some help. And through altruism, I, that money could not have been invested at that point. So in some ways, baby bonds is intended to protect individuals from their families. And you know, another last thing I'll say about baby bonds also is that people have, in some ways, bastardized the program by calling it child savings accounts on steroids. That's the wrong designation of baby bonds. Child savings accounts, again, I'm not necessarily opposed to, but they're intended to provide accounts so that people can save for the future of their children. Baby bonds are intended to protect children from their families, good or bad. So it has nothing to do with the savings behavior of your parents. Indeed, the wealth gap is not due to savings behavior, as Sandy pointed out. The idea is to give people, just like Social Security, a reserved account that's held by the federal government to help them when they, when they we, we have policies in our country for people when they age into their twilight, Social Security, and we have anti-poverty programs. But we don't really have programs intended for asset promotion except for the wealthy, except for things like mortgage interest deduction, except for things like capital gains deduction. In fact, the question that came up about budgets, we spend about $500 billion on that, on those, on those type of, this is really relevant given tax reform, on those asset promoting policies. But who benefits from them? The wealthy do. So baby bonds, if we're really gonna be uh, interested in giving people access to economic security through the security of wealth, we can use the tax, incentive, tax system in a much more progressive manner, which is funding baby bonds, which would give the resources to those that need it the most and would be far less expensive. $80 billion or $90 billion is one-fifth of the course of the $500 billion we're already spending. All right. Thank you. So much. I just got the word that we are done. We have to move on to the next thing. Um, let's give a round of applause to our <laughs>